Air pollution is generated by many human activities. Those include the obvious, like driving cars, trucks, and buses, and operating power plants and factories, but also from less obvious sources, like the use of lawnmowers, fertilizers, pesticides, paints, varnishes, and cleaning agents. Air pollutants are also generated naturally from smoke and ash from wildfires, sand and organic matter picked up by winds, pollen and other organic compounds from plants, and gases and ash from volcanic eruptions. Though these sources produce many pollutants, the Clean Air Act requires that the EPA set ambient air quality standards only for the six most common, ozone, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter, and lead. Lead regulation, and especially the phase-out of leaded gasoline, has been highly successful. Since 1980, the levels of lead in the air have been reduced by 96%. A lesson for all of us to keep in mind. Though human activity is the cause of much air pollution, human action also mitigates the cause. Though air pollution is emitted in both rural and urban areas, its sources are more highly concentrated in the built environment. Higher source density and the urban heat island effect work together to produce more air pollution in cities. During warm months, ground level ozone is the chief cause for concern. Unlike ultraviolet shielding upper atmospheric ozone, ground level ozone is a harmful pollutant. Ozone is a powerful oxidizer that can inflame lung tissue and damage plants. It's readily produced in warm temperatures when sunlight interacts with nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds released by the combustion of carbon-based fuels. Eight-hour average ozone concentrations in the U.S. typically range from 40 to 150 parts per billion. Values below 50 parts per billion are considered healthy, while concentrations above 100 parts per billion are considered unhealthy. AirNow's Air Quality Index puts these measurements into a useful rating system. Because transportation is the largest man-made source of ozone components, the sprawling regions that require residents to drive longer distances struggle more with air quality compliance than more compact cities. Ozone pollution levels are as much as 41 parts per billion higher in the most sprawling areas, which can mean the difference between safe, code green air quality and code red air quality studies have shown. Ozone is only one of many chemicals produced by the interaction of sunlight, nitrogen oxide, and volatile organic compounds. Formaldehyde, ketones, and various nitrates are also produced. This collection of chemicals is called photochemical smog. Along with suspended particulates, photochemical smog helps create the view-obscuring, eye-tearing haze that plagues cities during hot, calm summer days. Though ozone and photochemical smog can be produced during the cooler months of the year, they are primarily a warm season concern. The formation of photochemical smog depends on sunlight, and these reactions happen more efficiently when the sun shines longer and more directly overhead. However, regardless of season, it's important to keep up to date on the Air Now's Ozone Now forecast for your area. Winter weather brings conditions that promote temperature inversions. Whether a thermal inversion is caused by subsidence, radiant heat loss, or advection, it reduces or eliminates convection and leads to a relatively stable, unmixed lower atmosphere. This dome of cold air traps most airborne emissions in the atmospheric layer below the inversion. When this happens in a city with its many sources of air pollution, airborne pollutants, known as particle pollution, can quickly reach unhealthy levels and cause an unsightly haze that can spread to surrounding areas. Particle pollution is a complex mix of small particles and liquid droplets produced primarily by fossil fuel combustion. Solids and gases released by combustion react with moisture in the air to form chemically harmful droplets and solids. Acid rain is a classic example. It forms when sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides fall to the ground as solids and react with surface waters, or as they react in the atmosphere with water vapor to form chemically reactive droplets of sulfuric and nitric acid. Particle pollutants can be man-made or natural. 
forest fires, gases released from plants or volcanoes, agricultural burns, industrial processes, and dust from sandy or gravelly roads can all be sources. The size and chemical properties of particle pollution make it a health hazard. The EPA classifies particle pollutants as either coarse, those measuring from 2.5 to 10 micrometers across, or fine, those measuring less than 2.5 micrometers across. Fine particles can cause health problems if breathed into the lungs, where they react with lung tissue or are absorbed into the bloodstream. Air Now provides an up-to-date Particles Now forecast for particle pollutants on their website. Be sure to consult it regularly and keep your viewers up to date on current conditions. The same sources that generate harmful air pollutants also produce greenhouse gases. Due to their molecular size and geometry, greenhouse gases trap heat in the atmosphere by absorbing and re-emitting long-wave or infrared radiation, while allowing short-wave radiation to pass by. Most solar radiation is short-wave. This incoming radiation passes freely through greenhouse gases to reach the Earth's surface. The Earth then converts and radiates some of this energy back towards space as long-wave radiation. Some of this long-wave radiation is trapped by greenhouse gases inside the atmosphere. Much of this energy is directed back towards Earth, raising surface and ocean temperatures. As more greenhouse gases are added to the atmosphere, more energy is trapped. As this energy warms the land and oceans, the lower atmosphere, and thus weather and climate, are altered. Human activity produces four major categories of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases. Because carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide are both fossil fuel combustion products, they are both linked to our use of cars and electricity to power our cities. High pressure will dominate the weather in our area for the next five to seven days. That's the forecast to be aware of when considering air quality. High pressure is the primary cause of conditions that favor poor air quality. In the summer, warming, sinking air, a lack of cloud cover, and low winds and stagnant air create conditions favorable for photochemical reactions that make ozone and smog. In the winter, high pressure leads to a greater possibility of inversions, trapping pollutants in the urban boundary layer. Location is, of course, also a consideration. Hills and mountains promote the formation and persistence of inversions, and in cities with high ground on one or more sides, like Salt Lake City, Denver, or Los Angeles, inversions are more common and can last for weeks. Generally, the regions highlighted in this synoptic scale conceptual graphic show areas of potential good or poor air quality in relationship to fronts. Of course, mesoscale effects, such as mountain valley winds, local topography, and diurnal effects play a major role in how to tailor your forecast. And be sure to visit the Air Now website to learn more about including the daily air quality index in your forecast. The Air Now website includes a section dedicated to weathercasters. It includes many publications and resources that help you learn and share more information about air quality with your viewers. Regulation of industry at the state and federal level has traditionally been very effective in reducing air pollution. Sulfur, lead, and other heavy metals are much less of a problem today due to mandatory emissions reductions from power plants, factories, cars, and trucks. Federal fuel economy regulations, corporate average fuel economy, or CAFE, reduce the amount of transportation fuel being burned. And fuel additives like ethanol help gasoline burn cleaner further reducing emissions. Yet with all of these regulations, we're burning more coal to satisfy our ever-growing electrical needs. We're buying more consumer products, and we're driving more miles with more cars, offsetting most regulatory gains because of increased fuel consumption. So what can you do to help reduce air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions? Many things. In a nutshell, reduce energy consumption, buy sustainably manufactured energy-efficient products, and recycle. These actions reduce the amount of air pollutants generated on your behalf. Some of these actions are easy and obvious. Others are not, 
but many are achievable now and will become even easier to achieve as consumer demand increases availability of energy-efficient products. Explore the suggestions listed at the end of this presentation. They include many practical, easy-to-do actions to reduce air pollution.